Hi, it's Susan Swain, host of Q&A. This week, I want to introduce you to a new C-SPAN podcast. It's a companion to our 10-week special books and history series, Books That Shaped America. We've teamed up with the Library of Congress, selecting 10 books from across American history that have had a major impact on our society. Each week, the C-SPAN television program will focus on one of these books and its impact. This companion podcast will give you more background on the book's authors. If you want to learn more about books that shaped America, you can watch the series on Monday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on C-SPAN through November 20th, and even be part of a live on-air conversation through phone calls and social media. And this companion podcast will be available each week wherever you get your podcasts. The Federalist Papers are a series of 85 essays and a cornerstone of American political thought, one of the most important works in the history of the country. The essays were written between 1787 and 1788 by three of America's founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay, and they were intended to promote and defend ratification of the Constitution. In May of 1788, the original essays were combined into a single book titled The Federalist. Joining us now to discuss the authors of the Federalist Papers is Professor Colleen Sheehan of Arizona State University. Let's start off, Professor, by talking about the lives of Hamilton, Madison, and Jay before the Federalist Papers. Who were these men? Where were they from? What were their backgrounds like? And what were their roles in those very early years? Let's start with Hamilton. Sure. Uh, Hamilton's always good to start with, isn't he, Uh, these days? He's the most popular of the founders. Uh, So Hamilton actually wasn't born in the United States. He was born on a very small island, a a volcanic island in the Caribbean uh, called Nevis. It's down by St. Kitts. And his home is actually still there. I went and visited there, Paul, a a number of years ago before the play. And uh, the guard just happened to be, um, I don't know, getting lunch or something, and no one was there. And you just walked in and walked around. No one else was there. It wasn't very popular. Uh, But anyway, he was born in Nevis, and then he moved to St. Croix, grew up there. And when he was a teenager, um, he had a dream of coming to the United States. And uh, he was a precocious and talented young man and a clerk at the store. And uh, some of the folks on the island um, helped him out, and he, he uh, he came north. He settled in uh, at, at King's College, now Columbia, and uh, he, he actually thought about going to another school, but that he wanted to finish up in a year or two, <laughs> and they thought well, that was a bit too swift, so he went to King's College. Uh, John Jay, who was the oldest of the three, born in 1745, we're not sure if Hamilton was born in 1755 or 57. There's some dispute about that. But anyway, Jay's the oldest of the three, and he's also from New York and went to King's King's College, now Columbia. Uh, And Jay had an illustrious uh, service um, uh, record in um, foreign policy, primarily, but also in law. He was a chief justice of the United States Supreme Court. And then uh, finally, last but not least, is, of course, James Madison. uh, the middle aged of, of the two. So if Hamilton's born around 1755, uh, 57, Madison's born uh, 1751. And uh, Madison is, of course, part of the uh, Virginia crowd that included George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, uh, James Monroe. And uh, Madison's home is Montpelier. Uh, he uh, inherited the estate from his father, from his family. He, Madison was um, he's definitely the shyest of the three. Uh, if Hamilton was precocious, Madison was painfully bashful uh, and a very studious young man and, and a bit sickly sometimes, or at least he thought he was. Um, and so their personalities were very different, but all of them extremely talented and extremely dedicated to this project that they thought of as the American experiment in self-government. Were there one or two examples of uh, experiences that shaped each of them in their uh, young years as as young men? Oh, gosh, to pick one or two examples. 
Um, well, let's just let's just take one example from Hamilton. Um, when he was around sixteen, there was a a, a huge um, hurricane that happened, at, and where he lived in in Saint Croix, and he he writes this letter um, about his dreams about where he wants to go, what he wants to become. Um, and you can just picture him, Paul, looking across the Atlantic and um, with all of his, you know, at 60, with all of his life before him. Uh, and he made it happen. He made it happen. And so much so that when he comes to America, there are times when he looks around him because people are so attached to their states, and he adopted America. And his his uh, goal was, he said, he said America is a Hercules, but a Hercules in the cradle. And Hamilton's goal was to make Hercules grow up and be the strongest, best republic on the face of the earth. This man was ambitious. This man. Uh, was I think in some ways he was probably the smartest of the founders, at least in terms of pure IQ. I don't think he was necessarily the best read or the most thoughtful, not to say that he wasn't well read or thoughtful, but I think he was the quickest. And so when you think of his ambition, I think one of the things that's important for Hamilton is to think of him is always to tie his ambition to his adopted country. There was one point he looked around and people are all attached to their states and he says something to the effect, what, am I the only real American here? (laughs) He uh, identified with America. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Moving the story forward uh, some years. So we know that Hamilton and Madison also took part in the Constitutional Convention. What impact did they have there? What were their roles? Well, Hamilton was there in the beginning and then left – after a few weeks, but came back at the end and signed. Uh, His most famous contribution to the convention was his speech of June 18th. He he spoke for that entire day. And it's an amazing speech. Sometimes it's thought of as a famous speech, sometimes as an infamous speech, (laughs) Uh, because that's the speech in which he praises the British government and says that that it's uh, uh, the British government, which, of course, is a monarchy, is the best government in the world. And um, he he pushes for, you know, what's often thought of as a high-toned form of government, an executive that would serve for life or during good behavior and those kinds of things. And that earned him in, in later years after the formation of the new government under the Constitution, when he was in the Washington administration as Secretary of the Treasury, uh, he was often called a monocrat, that he was, you know, uh, not a true uh, believer in government by the people, that he was attached to monarchy. He called that, you know, absolutely ridiculous, that, that people were um, – uh, well, it was, you know, he, he said, well, that was those Jeffersonians. Those people who danced to the tune of liberty and drunk too deeply from the well of French philosophy. So there was that whole battle going on between Hamilton thinking that Jefferson and Madison were too democratic, too much of a believer in the people to the extent where it could become mob-like, like the French Revolution. And Madison and Jefferson um, thinking that Hamilton was maybe not enough of a, a true Republican. So take us to 1787, September. It's the fall now. The Constitution is is produced in Philadelphia, and it's sent to the states. Who came up with the original idea for these Federalist essays, and and why? And how did these three men ultimately come together to write them? Well, this is Hamilton. Hamilton is behind this all. He's the New Yorker. Um, Of course, Madison's from Virginia. John Jay's from New York. But this is Hamilton's plan. Hamilton was at the convention. And as I said, the reason he left Paul was because there were three delegates to the convention from New York. Uh, The others, um, uh, Yates and Lansing, were really just doing the work of then-Governor George Clinton, and they would become anti-Federalists. 
So Hamilton was always outvoted because each state delegation uh, had one vote. You, you know, the majority ruled for that, and the state delegation voted as a block. And so Hamilton lost all the votes. So he, he was pretty ineffective except for the June 18th speech, which actually pushed people to see that he could be that, – that they had to be careful and that the Virginia plan, Madison's plan, looked much more moderate. When in light of of um, Hamilton's plan, so it might have been a political move there, uh, actually. So when the when when the convention adjourns, a sign of die on what's now called Constitution Day, of course, September seventeenth. Uh, <clears throat> one of the states that was absolutely critical, but there was no guarantee that it would pass this new constitution, was New York. So Hamilton goes to work. And he um, solicits, you know, John Jay and some others to help him out, but but some of them turn him down, and he ultimately asks. Jay says yes, and then he ultimately asks his his Virginia colleague Madison, and Madison agrees to do it. So this is all this is all uh, Hamilton's uh, plan to try to get New York on board, uh, because without New York, quite frankly, it's probably not going to work. We talked about some of the experiences of these three men, the men who wrote the Federalist Papers, uh, Hamilton, Madison, and Jay. So we've talked about experiences. How about other influences? Who were their biggest influences as writers and, and thinkers? What did they actually read, and who did they study that informed their work here? Well, these men were very well read, all of them. And, in fact, I just recently did a project for the National Constitution Center on this very question. <laughs> um, so let me just, just name, you know, a few. I mean, uh, Hamilton was particularly influenced by um, uh, Alexander Pope, uh, Jacques Neckar, the Frenchman who was a minister of finance. Um, but they all read the classics, uh, the Greeks, the Romans. Um they had a genuine classical liberal education. Uh, you know, they're studying uh, languages and translating, oftentimes at the age of 11 and 12, Paul. Uh, this is just typical. Uh, and uh, Madison is, is very well read. Um, he, he reads in a number of languages. He ultimately goes to the College of New Jersey, now Princeton. Um, <clears throat> and he's read... If, if you look at his writings, his notes on government that he wrote in 1791, for example, where he's trying to figure out the theory of republicanism uh, to add on to the Federalist Papers, he's, he's quoting Thucydides, Xenophon, Plato, Aristotle, Gibbon, Montesquieu, Robertson. He, uh, the list just goes on and on. Um, there's not much these guys didn't miss. As you read through some of these Federalist essays, uh, Professor Sheehan, you, you, you look at the very first one, Federalist Number 1, the very first part of it, it jumps right out at you. The very existence of the Union is at stake, Hamilton yeah. writes. Tell us more about the pressure that the country was under, the pressure that Hamilton, Madison, and Jay saw for the country. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, this is a time when you, you see repeated... And, and all the broadsides and pamphlets and newspapers, that the eyes of the world are upon us. Liberty hangs in the balance. This is the great experiment in self-government, which, by the way, Paul, and I want to I really emphasize this because we take this for granted today. It had really never worked before. Government by the people had been a failure and Hamilton writes about that in Federalist Number 9 <clears throat> when he says, uh, you know, look at the petty republics of ancient Greece and Rome. Well, there might be momentary rays of glory that break through the gloom. Uh, it's really just a history of failure after failure. And so in Federalist Number 1, what he's really telling us is not only how critical this is, but what it would mean if we could actually do this. This would be the first time that a government was founded 
uh, a government that could be successful that was founded on the basis of reflection and choice rather than accident and force. I mean, look at that line in Federalist Number 1 where he says something like, um, it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country by their conduct and example to decide the important question, whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. Um, that is amazing. Just that sentence alone uh, is, is really, in one sense, if, if, if America were a story, that would be the opening line of that story. In terms of the writing, the actual writing, Professor, how did they divide their work in terms of who would write which essays? Who wrote the most essays and, and, and why? Well, Hamilton wrote the most, um, but it, that's probably because Jay was supposed to write more than he actually ended up writing. Uh you know they have a plan in the beginning, but they're they're under pressure. They're off, they're oftentimes writing these essays. At first, they're sharing them a little bit, but they're under pressure. And it's just like students. Just imagine being a graduate student. Oftentimes, you end up the night before staying up late at night to to make it by the deadline, right? And that happens to them as well. And so some of it gets you know more and more rushed. But what happens is Jay gets sick. Hamilton writes number one. Jay writes Federalist Papers two, three, four, and five. But that's it for Jay until he only writes one more later on, Federalist uh, 64. Um, and so Hamilton picks up more of the slack. And because, I mean, I'm assuming Jay is going to write more about things like foreign policy, but then Hamilton has to pick that up uh, and do, you know, a good, a good part of that. And finance, and most of the particularly theoretical essays are left to Madison. The theory of republicanism that starts with Federalist Thirty Seven. Though, of course, before that is the most famous Federalist paper that Madison writes, which is Federalist Ten. Did they actually coordinate on specific language, or look at, or edit, if I can use that word, each other's work in, in any way? How did that part of the process work? Well, we don't know exactly. Uh, we don't have that kind of, you know, any correspondence. What we do know, this is, I found this out a few years ago when I was just, just became more curious about Jay because he's so neglected when people talk about the Federalist Papers. And just a few days before the publication of the first Federalist Paper, which was October 27th, 1787, so, you know, just a little over a month after the Constitutional Convention adjourned. So there's not a lot of time for this planning, really. But um, five days before that, on October 22nd, Jay has a dinner party at his home uh, uh, in um, Westchester County, uh, New York. And um, his wife was the socialite of all socialites. You know, I mean, you know, so he... he their home is not too far from Bedford, New York, which is um, not far, you know, which is the, the location of Martha Stewart's farm. <laughs> and it's, it's ironic that Jay's wife, Sarah, uh, uh, Sarah Jay, is a sort of Martha Stewart of her time. <laughs> and, and they threw dinner parties all the time. But this one dinner party was all men. And among the guests were Madison and Hamilton. You have to think, you have to surmise that Jay, Madison, and Hamilton took some time by themselves over in a corner and talked about what was going to begin happening in just a few days. But um, I don't think they had a lot of occasions uh, to do that kind of plotting and planning, and I think a lot of it was um, on the fly. Makes me want to ask, do you see these men as having been friends with each other, the way we would think of friends today? That's a great question, Paul. They were definitely colleagues. Uh, and they were good colleagues. They agreed on, um, they, 
They were federal men, is what they called themselves. They wanted to strengthen the federal union. And they had that goal, that really critical, important goal in common. Uh, But they weren't buddies. Now, I mean, because buddies were people like, I I would say Hamilton and Governor Morris were kind of buddies. You know, they, they had... They had an incredible, they would dare each other. <laughs> that famous dare that Hamilton makes to Governor Morris that involves George Washington. I mean, these two guys were, sometimes they acted like frat brothers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then other good friends were uh, Madison and Jefferson. Very, very good friends. Um, Jefferson's a little older, and when he knows that he's close to the end of his life, he writes a letter to Madison, and he says, take care of me when dead. He means, please take care of my reputation. You understand me. You know what I've been about and what I've dedicated my life to. I count on you to do that. That kind of close, close friendship in which they're kind of mirrors to each other's soul, as Aristotle talks about it. That wasn't the kind of relationship that Hamilton and Madison and Jay had uh, with each other. But they were good colleagues, and they had a common cause. In writing the Federalist Papers, uh, Hamilton, Madison, and Jay decided to use a pseudonym, Publius. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from, and and, and why? Uh, It's Roman. It comes from, there are a lot of Publiuses (laughs) in Roman history, but this particular Publius is Publius Valerius Publicola, who was a Roman aristocrat uh, who led the charge to overthrow the monarchy and was known for his small-r Republican sympathies. He was a great leader of the Roman Republican cause. And so they deliberately chose that, or Hamilton chose it, um, to both hearken back to the classics and the the Republican tradition, um, you know, think of the great historians like Gordon Wood and J.G.A. Pocock and, and all of the work that's been done on this small R Republican tradition. And it's important to point out to contemporary listeners that they're not talking about Republicans and Democrats here. They're talking about Republicanism as a kind of government that's government by the people, popular government. And so that's what um, Hamilton chooses. But what it also means is um, I can't say no one knows who they are because there's one person who was told. Uh, But it's all a secret who Publius is. Um, They all sign every essay Publius. Uh, People don't know how many there are, if it's one or more, or who they are. Um, There's guessing, but... But I, but let me ask you, if I could, um, uh, who do you think was the one person that they told? Oh, gosh. Uh, this is why <laughs> I'm talking to you. Fair, this yeah. is why I'm talking to the yeah. professor. <laughs> What's the answer? Well, you know, this is, yeah, well, this is interesting because um, sometimes we think that these things about uh, great men are all myths, you know, just things made up for posterity. Uh But it's actually really true that George Washington stood apart from all the others. Um, The Parson Ween story, uh, well, well, the cherry tree might not be true. Um, The story that it conveys about the, the character of Washington and the greatness of Washington is true. Everyone respected Washington and knew that he, um, there was a uh, uh, just incredible respect, and um, they looked up to him. They didn't think of him as um, quite one of them. There was, I mean, he was not only the general that that uh, won the revolution. Everyone knew he would be first president of the United States. There was no question. And they also knew that if he didn't come to the Constitutional Convention, it probably would not be successful. Things depended on Washington. There was a letter uh, Jefferson writes to Washington when he wants to step down after his first term. And Jefferson writes to him and begs him, pleads with him, don't stay on another term. 
he says we are we meaning our country we're not ready yet to walk alone and so um uh, Washington was bigger than life, but that's not a myth. When you look at the, the product, these 85 essays, these Federalist essays, what would you say is the true impact of those essays? We, we know that they were written to influence the colonies, to ratify the Constitution. Uh, what was the true impact of their work um, from an historical perspective? Another great question, Paul, and particularly because it's such a difficult question. Uh, that's one of the points of controversy among scholars today. Um, <clears throat> certainly have, they had an impact in New York State. How much did impact, and, and New York does end up ratifying, of course, the, the Constitution. And that's important. Uh, they were republished. Um, you know, there's two major newspapers in New York that they're published in. They were republished elsewhere in other newspapers in New York and to some extent in other states. Um, at the time, how much impact did they have in terms of gaining support for the Constitution? Uh, anything I say is, is a guess. Um, but people were, you know, there's all these other Federalists who are writing in all the other states that are having an impact in their states. I would say that, though, that the um, there's certainly a long-term impact of the Federalist Papers. Jefferson called the Federalist Papers the best commentary on the principles of government that was ever written. And even though they're dashed off, many of them in haste, um, and they're not a work of political philosophy, you know, it's, there's not a comprehensive, systematic outline to this, this project, Hamilton attempts to do that, but, you know, I mean, they are works of politics. They're op-eds. But for op-eds, they're pretty darn impressive <laughs> in terms of the ideas that they deal with and the level of thoughtfulness um, about popular government, Republican government. Um, and it, th there are flashes of brilliance in these essays. It's not um, surprising that uh, Supreme Court justices often cite the Federalist Papers from then until now. They're still being cited. Um, the Federalist Papers are a commentary on our Constitution and help us to understand not only the provisions of the Constitution, Paul, but the purpose of the Constitution. You know, we sometimes forget that forest for the trees. The, the, the constitutional law is just, it's not just a set of rules. It has, a, the Constitution as a whole has a purpose. You know, it's stated generally in a preamble. Um, so we have to figure out, you know, so how do we secure the blessings of liberty and secure this idea of justice for all? I mean, that's the dream. But it's an unfulfilled dream in many ways, and in many very important ways at the founding, uh, particularly, of course, because of the institution of slavery, which there were some people at the convention who said, if you try to get rid of slavery, because some delegates uh, definitely railed against slavery at the convention, including Governor Morris, Rufus King, and others, um, but the Pinckney's from South Carolina, for example, said um, uh, South Carolina won't join. We, we won't be part of this union under the new Constitution if you do that. And so how many slaves is the implication? Are you really going to free if you outlaw slavery? All the states with it are probably not going to join. As we uh, wrap up, Professor, what would you say is the legacy of these three men, Hamilton, Madison, and Jay? Um, tell us. Ah, that's not only a great question. That's one of the toughest questions for our time today, isn't it, Paul? Because what we see is um, uh, the war that we see, the battle in America today uh, between two um, ideological sides, um, this is involving things like tearing down statues of the founders. Uh, including, by the way, um, of certainly, uh, you know, I mean, of, 
I mean, what's going on at Montpelier, um, the attacks on Madison at his home. Um, Hamilton hasn't gotten it as, as badly. Um, certainly Jefferson is, is the brunt of a lot of this, and there's a better reason for that. Um, but, of course, these men were not perfect. Uh, on the other hand, I mean... We probably ought not to throw stones at glass houses. Uh, that's one thing. But it's also, I think, the most important legacy is that they looked at this land that Robert Frost called uh, artless, unstoried, unenhanced. And they had a vision for what it could become. And they sacrificed a great, great part of their lives to try to set the stage to make the experiment in self-government successful. This meant everything to them. As Lincoln would say later on in the Lyceum Address, if they failed, we won't remember them. If they succeeded, we'll probably name rivers and states, and I can add universities uh, after them. Lincoln says they succeeded. My question to our listeners is, did they? Because part of their success depends on us understanding what they did and paying it forward. With that, uh, we say thank you to Professor Colleen Sheehan of Arizona State University. Much appreciated. Thank you for this great conversation. Thanks, Paul. It was great to talk with you. Thanks for listening to the Books That Shaped America podcast. For more information about the series, you can visit our website, cspan.org slash books that shaped America. And remember to follow this podcast so you never miss an episode.